Coming up, it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We'll hear from the director of the Strong Hearts Native Helpline and find out what they offer. Plus, Kyle Samatskuku came in 48th out of more than 15,000 runners at the Boston Marathon on Monday. He'll join us in our studio. I'm Patty Tholahungva. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from Indian Country Today. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalohungba. President Joe Biden took new steps Monday to improve education for Native students. He signed an executive order on Indigenous Peoples Day that directs the Secretaries of Education, Interior, and Labor to lead a new initiative on education. Biden's executive order says that because Native students have historically faced trauma from boarding schools and assimilation, they have challenges that merit attention and action from the federal government. The initiative will focus on understanding the systemic causes of education challenges, improve data collection, and increase the percentage of Native children who participate in early childhood programs. One year after the order, the secretaries are required to provide a report directly to the president on the, program, on the progress of the project. The order directs the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, to designate an executive director of the project. In Virginia, the George Mason University Law School is announcing its new tribal law and economics program. Adam Krippel is a citizen of the United Homa Nation, and he is the assistant professor of law and director of the program. The goal of the tribal law and economics program is to serve indigenous communities and apply analysis to legal institutions that govern tribal lands, as well as hosting educational insight. The head of the Minnesota-based Minnetonkan Moccasins is apologizing for appropriating Native American culture. The company specializes in moccasins with obvious characteristics of American Indian footwear. It's not actually run by Native Americans. For years, opponents say the product, its logo, and its advertisements are dangerous in their representations of race. Shauna White Bear owns and operates White Bear Moccasins in Bozeman, Montana. White Bear, who also mentors Native American women in leatherwork, says actions speak louder than words. We're making progress. Like everything that I were doing, all this younger generation, all these younger artists that are coming out and um, capitalizing on their craft, like it's about time. Uh, I hope that they will support other indigenous makers, like do what they say they're going to do. The footwear company says it's recruiting more Native Americans and will use transparent language to describe the company's background. In Florence, Italy, a month-long meeting called Wo'a Lakota 2021 has kicked off. The event is between Italian institutions and a delegation of the Lakota Sikanju Nation. The idea is to renew friendships, share cultural exchanges, and traditional ceremonies. The official title of the celebration is called the Remembrance Day for All American Indians of the Americas and the Lakota. The gathering will include meetings, conferences, events, and an exhibition at Palazzo Medici Riccardi. And Alaska Native Podcast is one of the winners of this year's Covering Climate Now Journalism Awards. Coffee and Quack was created by Inupiaq journalist Alice Quanick Glenn. The episode, Alaska Natives on the Frontline, won in the audio radio category. The show provides a rare inside look at the impact of climate change on the indigenous community of Utkiavik, Alaska. 
Through an intimate uh, conversations with residents, the journalists drew listeners into a cultural un into a culture unfamiliar to many. The revealing show highlights an indigenous tundra existence as the planet warms and their resourcefulness adapts to survive. Coffee and Quack's entry was one of 12 winners selected from more than 600 entries from 38 countries. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalahungva. Coming up, Kyle Sumatskaku crossed the finish line at the Boston Marathon in 2 hours, 26 minutes, and 17 seconds. We'll hear how he did it. But first, we talk with Lori Jump about resources her organization has to address domestic violence. We'll be right back. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. According to the National Institute of Justice, domestic violence disproportionately impacts Native Americans and Alaska Natives. More than 1.5 million Native women and 1.4 million Native men experience violence during their lifetime. This conversation will discuss some topics of violence which can be triggering for some, so please take care of yourself as you need. We're joined today by Lori Jump, who is the director of the Strong Hearts Native Helpline. The helpline provides services to Native people impacted by domestic, dating, and sexual violence. Welcome, Lori. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Tell us about your initiative. Yeah, well, so Strong Hearts Native Helpline is a national, anonymous, and confidential helpline um, built by and for Native Americans and Alaska Natives who are experiencing um, domestic dating or sexual violence. So we help you know, those who are experiencing the violence themselves. We also uh, work with people who might have a friend or relative that's experiencing violence and are looking for ways to help that person. Um, and we even have um, abusive partners that call in um, for some help as well. And how did this helpline begin? You know, it's it's interesting because the um, National Domestic Violence Hotline is one of our parent um, organizations, along with the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. And what the National Domestic Violence Hotline found was that in spite of the very high rates of violence that our community experiences, and we have the highest rates across the country, really, um, very few Native Americans were actually contacting the National Helpline for, for assistance. And they reached out to form a, uh, a grassroots um, advocacy group, people that were working in Indian country, and then the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center to find out why that might be, right? Like why were our people not reaching out for help? Um, and really what they found out was that to best serve Native Americans, um, our specific population has some unique barriers um, to justice and services. Um, it really would be best to actually launch a helpline specifically for Native Americans. And so that's, that's what they did. Um, again, highly unusual, I think, for a national organization to reach out to Indian country um, and, and help us start such an important service for our relatives. And part of the helpline actually includes um, culturally based services. What does that look like? Yeah, you know, as I said, I think our population has some unique barriers um, that the average, you know, American citizen doesn't face, um, including, you know, just jurisdiction is really probably the, the biggest 
you know, barrier that our people face um, due to the unique legal relationship we have. And then the laws that have been passed that really have limited tribal nations ability to prosecute crimes in Indian country. So really having an understanding of that is, is critical. And then, you know, we do have, um, you know, there are 574 tribal nations across the country. So when we say that we're culturally specific, obviously our, you know, we, we have about 25 advocates that are working the lines. We can't adequately represent all tribal nations, but there are a lot of similarities that we do share, right? And I think that, um, you know, being just very native centered, being, um, you know, we all share that respect for all living things and starting from that point and then talking with our contacts about what their culture looks like in their communities. What are their resources that they have access to and, and how do their um, tribal people really practice healing and tradition and ceremony in their communities? You said earlier that, um, you know, many years ago, you were finding that a lot of Native people didn't call these helplines. Um, but now that you're implementing services, just like the ones you talked about, are you seeing an increase in numbers of people who are trusting that this is a great source for them? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, we started out, of course, with very limited operational hours. And, and so, you know, it took us really about a year and a half to get to our first 1000th call. And we've now had over 12,000 calls. And so, you know, it, it just grows exponentially every, every year. Um, we're about four and a half years old now. And so, um, you know, just really exciting to see that, that, people are trusting us, that they are reaching out for help. And, you know, outreach is a critical piece of that. And so, um, you know, having uh, opportunities to share our information, um, you know, through, through what we're doing right here this morning is really important to us. If someone was thinking about calling the helpline and reaching out for the help that they um, want, what does that look like for them? Do they, um, you know, call the number and then who do they speak to? Typically, how does it look like? Yeah, you know, people can reach us in three ways. Actually, we have implemented, you know, we have, of course, telephone services. We now have chat services as well as text. And so they can reach us one of those three ways and they're gonna connect with an advocate um, who is um, Native American, number one, um, you know, who've been trained really in, in not just, you know, what domestic violence is, what it looks like, um, you know, and of course for dating and sexual violence as well. But, you know, what does safety planning look like? What does, um, you know, healing in your individual communities look like? And really they, you know, they provide a lot of peer support, which we, I think is critical um, for those who contact us. We spend a lot of time just supporting them, validating them, you know, that what they're experiencing is, is domestic violence, that it's not okay, that they don't deserve it. Um, and then, you know, walking through what resources might be available in their community. We know that, you know, obviously answering that initial call is critical, but also the long-term support is, is very important. So we always try to connect them back to somebody in their own home communities that can provide ongoing support. You mentioned, um, you know, one of the services you offer is to um, essentially help people identify if they are in an abusive relationship or in an unhealthy relationship. How do people identify that? Yeah, you know, talking through what they're experiencing, right? And, you know, for us, we've identified, you know, a number of attributes that are found in healthy relationships, as well as um, then, you know, going from healthy to unhealthy to actually abusive, right? And so we really talk about exactly what somebody is experiencing. And it's uh, a lot of times people don't understand that they are experiencing violence, right? So many people think that if it's not physical, then it's not domestic violence. And really, you know, the physical abuse, of course, is, is horrible, but it's just one factor. There are so many other ways um, to experience violence. What do you think are some of the misconceptions of experiencing violence? Well, you know, I think that some of the most damaging violence really is the, the psychological abuse that, and emotional abuse that somebody experiences that really makes them feel that they don't deserve 
to, to live a happy, healthy life, right? That they are not deserving to be treated well. And it's very damaging and it makes it very difficult for somebody to reach out. And so, uh, you know, I think that they don't identify that as, as I said, as, as domestic violence. And, and so we do a lot of education. Lori Jump, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. When we come back, we'll meet the native runner who placed 48th overall in the Boston Marathon. The mileage between Moncopie, Arizona to Boston, Massachusetts is more than 2,500 miles. And when you're preparing for the Boston Marathon, you might have to run that far in training. When runners lined up for the 125th Boston Marathon on Monday, Kyle Simutskaku was there. He's Hopi and from the village of Moncopie in northeastern Arizona. He joins us now to tell us about his experience at Boston and about his goals to one day make the U.S. Olympic team. Welcome to Phoenix, Kyle. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and it's a great honor and privilege to be here. And it's good to be back on Arizona soil. So it's good to be back home. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to set the stage here a little bit. Uh, you ran the Boston Marathon in two hours and uh, 26 minutes, uh, 48th place overall with um, an average pace per mile per mile of five minutes and 35 uh, seconds. That is unbelievable. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it's really uh, humbling and um, I'm really happy and content of how the results went and the performance. So all in all, I'm happy. Well, it's been a few days now. Um, how have you been recovering from uh, such a run? Yeah, all in all, you know, just taking slowly but surely, you know, winding down, kicking, kicking the feet up. Um, of course, I had like a post marathon race massage as I usually, I uh, typically have and um yeah so you know just drinking a bunch of electrolytes protein and water just to give my my muscles extra blood flow and just all the nutrients that they need from from the race so yeah yeah so tell us how, how did you train for this like what was the longest i guess mileage you had to run or what were you regularly running so in the beginning of time uh, i was running uh 80 to 90 miles and then you know as um fitness started to evolve and it will carry on to a hundred miles every week. So, you know, um, I have some, uh, crucial, uh, workouts will be track and then it will be, uh, a progression run too as well. And then of course you got your recovery runs and then you got, you have, you have your, uh, long, uh, Sunday long runs. So between 18 to 19 miles or 20 miles, give or take, that's it. Wow, that's really far. For me, that's like from my res to the nearest Walmart. <laughs> so <laughs> that's quite a distance. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of how you prepared and how you showed up. Um, it sounds like you prepared a lot for this. You trained and, um, you know, worked really hard to make this happen. Um, did you accomplish your goals that you had set out for yourself? Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, um, from my previous uh, first marathon debut from Shiprock Marathon, uh, my personal first personal best was 238.08. And then, you know, I kind of made a promise and a goal for myself, looking at the bigger picture, if I'm going to be racing on the grand stage of Boston Marathon, um, I'm, of course, the roads, 
the road, the course is going to be hilly and of course, hot break hill. You know, I just wanted to set the standard and the bar high for my first Boston Marathon debut. So, you know, it took a lot of preparation. I uh, waited for two years uh, with the whole pandemic, uh, you know, kind of getting in between of me training and getting ready. And then, you know, with the Boston Marathon being postponed until like another year, you know, and um, I just kind of had to keep my, uh, I had to keep myself um, in high spirits and then just continue what uh, I was uh, dri dri like pretty much uh, focusing on wanted to do. And yeah, so I just kept my faith strong and, you know, just kind of roll with the punches and just try to remain uh, optimistic about it. Yeah, well, you did set that bar pretty high. You were the, um, I believe, the first Native person to cross the finish line at the Boston Marathon. Can you tell us, um, as you were running, did you ever hit a wall, or what was your experience like in terms of um, actually running the race? Uh, you know, uh, from from the start, you know, it was kind of nutty because uh, you had to catch the bus, and then you had to walk, like, at least a mile to the starting line, and it was super crowded. And, of course, I wanted to uh, start at my uh, designated uh, corral time. So, you know, it was pre-warm up, uh, late uh, bathroom <laughs> stops because it was so nerve wracking and I was so nervous. And, you know, um, of course, uh, I had a few, few of my team members saying that it's going to be, the crowd is going to be so uproaring, you know, don't let that uh, face through your mind, you know, just focus and then just don't let the whole, audience uh just creep up on you and you waste all that adrenaline because of the crowd just feeding off the energy what they deliver so you know i just kind of kept my composure um you know just kept my form and just pretty much kind of like in a deep meditation of uh just focusing and running my own race but then again you know i just mentally and spiritually i just wanted to stay on point and making sure i follow the race plan from the start to the finish. Now that we have you here, let's talk about this legendary line of Hopi runners, um, specifically Luis de Wanima. Um, was he somebody who you looked up to? Uh, yeah, in the beginning of time, as uh, I started falling in love with running, you know, from when I was a little boy, uh, you know, I guess I kind of just fall fell into his footsteps, knowing that, you know, I was just fulfilling my fruitful, youthful years and, you know, just running around in the village and even on the playground at the Mokubi Day School. But as time went on and uh, as I got older, you know, um, my dad, he told me about Louis Diwanima and he gave me like his whole like uh, biography about him. And then, you know, I was kind of astonished. I was kind of surprised. And I didn't even know from the bat, like he was um, a, an a Olympic runner. And, you know, that kind of like uplifted my spirits of falling more and more and knowing that I really want to following his footsteps and knowing that he fulfilled those um, Hopi uh, customs of being a Hopi dry farmer and taking care of his village and, you know, just um, promoting health and wellness and just making sure that the youth will be inspired. And, you know, that whole bigger picture there is what I was truly, I guess, grasped upon and that really attracted me to fall more and more. The, how much how much running really meant to me. So, mm. yeah. Talking about other notable Native people, um, Interior Secretary Deb Holland, of course, ran the Boston Marathon. Um, tell us, did you see her there? Um, and, you know, what was it like to be able to share, I guess, that experience with another Pueblo person? Uh, I'm pretty sure I have. Maybe I was, I missed her. Maybe she was nearby. <laughs> I don't know. But I felt her presence, you know, of course, knowing that the fact that it was, I guess, a blessing in disguise that, the Boston Marathon fell on Indigenous Peoples Day. And, you know, that was something so of a bigger spectacle, knowing that it's on Indigenous Peoples Day, you know, it's something that we're all, all other Native Americans who will be racing the Boston Marathon, you know, we met up, we met up in Copley Square and they um, even made a beautiful uh, Indigenous uh, Peoples Day uh, past uh, runners and future runners mural. It was. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely beautiful, and there were some iconic past runners such as Patty Dillon and um, uh, Tarzan Brown, of course. 
and then of course the future uh, Boston Marathon runners. But you know, I was hoping that we would catch her there and just indulge her and acknowledge her that we felt her presence and the whole unity and just all around it was just good medicine for her to be there and yeah. Well, I have so many more questions about Boston, but we only have a short time uh, left together. Um, tell us what is next for you in the future? Um, I hear that there might be some talk about um, a U.S. Olympic team. What, is, what will it take to get there? Uh, you know, of course, uh, I just got to remain uh, focused and of course stick to training, but you know, um, we don't even know what's next yet. I mean, this is, this is not only the end, this is only the beginning for me and you know I'm just looking forward to see what unfolds and of course uh, the Olympic team is kind of like a long and personal goal for me and you know as I stay on the right path and just um, shoot for the stars and you know just have that ambition to take on that uh, goal and see what unfolds from there but of course um, London Marathon or any other world major marathons will be in mind. Well, we'll definitely follow along. Kyle, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news and updates, visit us anytime at IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.